everyone, and welcome again to the Experience Maker Show. My name is Dan Gingis, customer experience speaker and coach, and I'm so excited to have you here today for another episode. Really, really excited about our guest today. So I met her sort of, I don't know, I'd call it probably randomly. We were both at a VIP weekend uh, in Harlem in New York, and uh, we met and we were sort of intentionally placed together because we both had a customer experience background and uh, I just found an amazing person that I am so excited to know. So Kim Newton spent almost 10 years at Hallmark leading customer experience there. And she is now, she has gone to the bright side with me. She is now a, an entrepreneur, a solopreneur and founder of the Intentional Pause Project. So excited to have you today. Welcome Kim to the show. Thank you, Dan. It's so great to be here. Um, I'm always excited about talking with, uh, you know, an expert in their field, which you are. And then on top of that, you're a friend. So just uh, excited to be here. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you are here as well. And uh, let's start with if you can just tell us a little bit about your background. I didn't do it nearly enough justice, sure. but uh, sure. how you got here. Yeah, so um, I I am originally from California and I live in Kansas City now. And uh, in the intro, I was chuckling because you said I was at Hallmark for, for 10 years and I was there for 23. Um, so, oh, really? really? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so um, I'm originally from the Bay Area and I, I went to school in Nashville um, and, and came to Kansas City to work right after my MBA in marketing. Um, after my undergrad in accounting, which by the way, I interned in accounting and I always tell everybody to intern because I learned that I didn't want to work in accounting, not one single day. So I, I literally went straight through and uh, got in a marketing MBA and I wanted to integrate art and business. I have a huge creative side to me, which you know, and um, Hallmark at the time had one of the largest creative organizations and I really wanted to work with creative leaders and uh, a creative community. So I came there and I literally had a two year plan um, and you know how plans go. Um, but I met my husband in Kansas City and you know, it was um, clearly an opportunity for me to grow because I spent almost, you know, 20, 20 plus years there. Um, and I always talk about my background at Hallmark in three chapters. So I can do it pretty quickly because in 23 years, you do a lot of things. But one of the things that attracted me to the company was obviously the brand. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the brand. But, um, you know, the fact that marketing was so vast. Um, and so I spent my first 10 years in all things marketing, multicultural marketing, um, product marketing. Uh, I was marketing for the Gold Crown stores. They had 4,000 stores at the time. Um, brand marketing. So everything marketing. Um, and then switched to my, so I call that my functional chapter. And then I switched to my cross-functional chapter where I started to look at the company end to end. And I led, um, I was a leader for commercialization and innovation for a transformation that the company was doing. That's a lot of shuns, but that's, that's what I was doing. And um, it was the first time I saw the company end to end. And, you know, I learned a lot about how, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, how the company did work versus how it was supposed to work. Um, and I loved that view. I loved the end to end view. Um, and I wanted the rest of my career to kind of have that end to end view. And so then I led um, Everyday Cards, which was one of the largest businesses. Um, if you think about the Dewey Decimal System of Life, that's what I call it, um, a card for any occasion uh, that's not a season, that was that business. Um, and uh, then I started my third chapter, which I call Enterprise Leader, where I switched into strategy um, and helped the retail business, the product business. I went to corporate strategy where that included entertainment and Hallmark on Crayola um, and the global business. Um, and then I think my most fun job, uh, which was leading consumer experience for the Hallmark brand. Um, and I did that the last couple of years that uh, I was at Hallmark. And, you know, I'd say it started with a brand strategy, which I think good consumer experiences do start with. Um, and uh, led a couple of initiatives that really just streamlined 
uh, you know, how people experience the brand. So um, that's when I became super addicted to consumer experience. I think it is the epitome of merging strategy with operational, getting stuff done. And um, yeah, I love that. And then that's how I met you. You know, we were talking about the fact that we had this in common. So yeah, that's that's a little background on me until I got to this point, So, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Awesome. Well, our, our shared uh, friend in common is Marquesa Petway, who also was a guest on this show. And she was smart enough to, uh, I think she did a couple of VIP weekends, but she intentionally planned that we were at the same one because she knew we'd have a lot to talk about. So yes, kudos to Marquesa. Sense. Yes. Um, and uh, so that's awesome. So, all right, that obviously begs the question then, you spent uh, over 20 years at Hallmark and now you decided to do the crazy thing that so many of us have decided to do and, and I for one will never look back. You decided to go off on your own and tell us a little bit about the Intentional Pause Project. I was there when yeah. you were still thinking of a name for it and all that, so um, yes. tell me. Well, I have to tell you a little bit of background. Um, so at about 20 years at you know Hallmark, I was starting to feel like, you know, I, I, mean, I never intended to be at one company in my entire career. Um, and, you know, I, I loved my career at Hallmark. I had a great time. There was really nothing wrong, but I started to feel like I wasn't meeting my own potential um, and that there was something else out there. And so, um, you know, as we do, sometimes when we're working in corporate America, our heads are down and we're just super focused on the business. But I just decided to like, poke my head up and look left and right and say, what else is out there? And um, I, so I exploded my network and I exploded, um, you know, who was influencing my thinking about what I could do in the world. And um, a really game changing moment for me was I got into the Henry Crown Fellowship with the Aspen Institute. And it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a coveted experience. It's super exciting, you know, that I got in because like 600 people are nominated and 60 people are interviewed and 20 are chosen. And I was super excited and honored to be in it. But they, they, one of the things that you have to do to get in is not just like be awesome or something. It's, it's, you have to um, articulate your inflection point. And, um, this was a fantastic exercise for me if I got in or not, but I actually had to articulate like where I was and what I was feeling. And, um, you know, the, the, so I knew that I wasn't, I was feeling like I wasn't meeting my own potential. And I told myself that, um, and in, inside of the, um, fellowship, you have to start a venture and there's two requirements, one that it makes the world a better place and that you're super passionate about it. Um, and so that's how the intentional pause uh, was born. Um, and it is, it literally, I was feeling like I wasn't fulfilled and I was mentoring women all over, you know, the, the country and they were kind of like achieve, 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 but not necessarily feeling fulfilled and, you know, extremely overwhelmed, but underwhelmed at the same time. And so I'm like, why are we doing this? <laughs> but the most interesting thing that I thought was amazing was that only 36% of these women said that they were following their dreams. And so I was like, okay, I think the world would be a better place if more women were following their dreams. Um, so I commissioned two research studies. One was quantitative, um, nearly 400 women. And another was qualitative where I really went deep on some insights. Um, and I learned a couple things um, and, and, and I was trying to figure out what am I gonna do with this information when you and I met? Um, one, women need, well, I should start here. 91% of women said that they were unapologetically ambitious um, and extremely overwhelmed. 87% said personally um, and less 73% professionally. Um, but you know, that's where the 36% came from only were following their dreams. So when I was like, okay, what am I going to do about this? The research said that they need three things, permission to pause by far the number one issue was that this idea of being still long enough to think was not even an option. Like <laughs> autopilot is the thing. Um, and then the second was tools to help navigate. What is it that I want to do? And three, um, you know, 
strategies to fight fear. Um, and so I developed a workbook and um, I, so I wanted to put together a platform. That's where the intentional pause, you know, project came from, because I do think it's going to be a project uh, to get more women following their dreams. Um, and I wrote a workbook and came up with a process and approach. I took my strategy background and my mentoring background um, and I put it together into this approach. And um, this is the part that's super fun, Dan. Um, so as I'm putting this together and, and I'll talk to you about the process, um, but I decided, you know what? I should be following my dreams. <laughs> like this is so cool, but I should be following my dreams. And as you know, I'm a quilter on the side uh, for years. Um, and I decided I was gonna pursue my artwork more seriously. And um, when all of this was happening, it wasn't on the same trip I was with you in Harlem, but I came back to New York the next month and. Um, I was talking to an amazing mentor of mine. Her name is Mindy Grossman. And I showed her my artwork and she's like, oh my God, I have to buy this for Oprah for her birthday. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> and so I sold my per first piece of artwork that was gifted to Oprah. And I took that as a That's sign. Amazing. It was good. And uh, yeah, so I followed my dreams uh, while I was writing the intentional pause and launched uh, a gift quilt company. So um, I have a line of gift quilts coming out, um, as well as the Intentional Pause book. Awesome. And here, and here it is, the brand new website that you yeah, just launched. I do. Um, I, I love it. I um, I love these images, all of them. Um, and uh, I literally went, this this middle image here with you, like, almost almost pushing this in my face. I'm like, I gotta look at this. Like I, I it was really, really cool. Um, let's bring up some of, uh, let's bring up some of your quilts while we're here so we can look at uh, just amazing, amazing work that you're doing. Um, Thank you. Really, really beautiful. And uh, and I know, my, my mom was a quilter as well and I know the work it takes. So uh, these are not easy. Yeah, so these are my gift quilts. Um, you should head over to my art studio so I can show you my art ones. But these are um, inspired by my art quilts. And um, yeah, so here are my art quilts um, and they're one of a kind. So they are um, just one of them in the world. Um, and you see that I've sold a lot since I sold my first last year. <laughs> so I kind of embraced it. Um, and, uh, but, but I always joke because people are like, what are the gift quilts and how are they different? I'm like, if my art quilts, you know, and Pottery Barn had a baby, that's what my gift quilts are. <laughs> and wrapped in giftability. So they are literally manufactured, handcrafted in small batches. Um, and, you know, they're there to, because I can't make quilts for everybody uh, and I want to, but there was such a, a visceral response to it um, that I wanted to create it so more people could enjoy it. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm super excited, and I I literally was writing the intentional pause, um, the workbook when I was contemplating doing this, um, and so there's a lot of me in the book um, and the process that was effective for me. So let's uh, I'm going to bring this back up one more time because I want you to talk also about the intentional pause so that people understand this is a this is a different part. I mean, this is different than the quilting business. Um, yes. But t tell us about so you said that one of the things that came up in your research was the, the power of the pause, as it says here, mm -hmm. or, or the necessity to take a pause. And so what are you doing for uh, for your female clients who are looking mm -hmm. to make a pause in their life? Well, the big thing is that um, they wanted tools. So there was a lot of references to being inspired by other people, but they needed something that they could tangibly do themselves. Um, so that's why I came up with a workbook. And Dan, I think we talked about this that weekend. I never, ever aspired to write a book. Like that is not on the list. Um, and so it was pretty amazing to, to like think about it as a process, which, you know, a strategic process. It's basically a personal strategy. And so there are five intentional pauses that are in the, the workbook. Pause to audit, because as we know, any strategy, any good strategy starts with a good assessment. Um, and then we go into dream and there's exercises to help pull your, your desires out of you and your purpose. Um, and then activate, which is like best practice, 
for um, you know setting goals. I think the thing that's most differentiating about it is the next piece, which is fortify. So if if fear is the number one thing, and it's I'm getting so much feedback from men, they're like, hey, we apply too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I studied why people give up. And there are five reasons, main reasons why people give up. And so I crafted something called your forest, which is your fears, your obstacles, your relationships, your emotions, and your self-talk. And so the intentional pause not only pulls your dreams out of you, but it also helps you develop an emotional plan to get after them. Um, and so this idea of developing an emotional plan that can be with you um, on that journey to fortify you in those moments that you want to give up, um, and I had plenty of them. Um, and then the last step is Actify, which is taking the action plan that you have for your goals and your emotional plan and merging them together into a series of intentional pauses in the future. Um, so I'm getting great feedback on it, um, I think. Uh, from a lot of different ages, um, you know, people who are definitely like you and I, a little antsy in corporate America, wondering if they should take the big leap, uh, people who are retiring, but also younger folks who, you know, are in the midst of, I mean, think about what COVID has done, right? And yeah. I, in emotional planning to culture and transformation um, and in a company, and you know, you can't transform something without culture, right? And so I'd say it's the same for yourself personally. Um, you can't transform if you you haven't, you know, checked your personal culture. So um, yeah. yeah, so I'm trying to speak and sell it and it's, it's super cool. That's awesome. And, you know, it reminded me a little bit and I don't know if we've talked about this. I think I've mentioned it on the show though, that it took me two years on my own in business to realize that I had spent my entire corporate career uh, over-indexing on the things that weren't as important. I was over-indexing on titles and promotions and salary and bonus and stock. And I was under-indexing on job satisfaction and mental health and general happiness. And now that I work for myself and I feel what it's like to just be excited to go to work every day and be happy with what I do and be and be full of passion. It's um, it's amazing how valuable that is. And it makes those other things start to feel less valuable. Of course, we want to make money in our businesses. We have to make money in our businesses. Yes. But it's about being fulfilled in a different way that, to be honest, I never knew. I'm not sure that I knew I was missing until mm -hmm. I experienced it on the other side. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, and and I love the, I, I remember telling you when we first met, I love the concept of the intentional pause because work is, because our lives are so busy, work life, home life, whatever's going on, we never stop. And uh, I mean, even my teenage daughter likes to say like, you know, man, every week is just the same, you know, yeah. Monday and I go yeah. to school and, and then I'm like, but it's the weekend. And she's like, yeah, but it'll be over soon. And then I'll be back to school. And it's it's just the world just moves. And and if you don't stop and and, and enjoy it for a few minutes, it's you're really missing something. Um, hopefully you saw the wonderful, inspiring uh, message um, that came in from, I think it's Shaira. Please tell me, um, because we've been talking a lot on social. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, my buddy Ryan Baker also left, uh, I told Ryan about his really long messages, but this one fits. That's awesome. Good. So he says he loves the idea of exploding your network. Um, yes. His old boss supported him. That is true. He and I met because his boss let him go to a conference and and we, mm -hmm. uh, we met there. Um, so Mark Schaefer in his new book uh, talks about networking up, another way to talk about picking your mentors and networking carefully. Any tips or thoughts that you have here? I've been thinking about it a lot more than right network can change your career. Totally agree. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, I'm, and this is one of the things I definitely mentored and talked to a lot of people about. There are different kinds of networks and you need them to do your job, right? There's your operational network, which helps you get work done. Um, there's your, you know, your mentors who uh, advise you. And then there's your sponsors who open doors for you. And you need all of those inside of the company. I think, you know, for me, I did two things. I took that same framework and I took it outside the company. And I said, okay, who's gonna open doors for me outside of the company? Who is going to help mentor me 
you know, getting away from the company, if that makes sense. And then, yeah. you know, how am I going to think about, you know, um, my operational network or the people that can help me day to day think about new things? And that's when, you know, I joined personally, I joined the network of executive women. I joined um, the executive leadership council. Um, I sought new experiences to meet people. So at conferences, I didn't just think about, gosh, you know, how am I going to meet this person and how does that benefit Hallmark? But how do I, you know, introduce and help someone out because I want them in my network in case I call on them and or they need me in the future. And that's the other thing is you have to have a give give, you know, like you're giving and, you know, you'd expect them to give. And um, but if you offer yourself up first, that's that's a really interesting way to improve and tighten external networks. Um, so totally. yeah, I think you have experiences that you don't normally have that stretch your brain, like going yeah, to the VIP weekend with Dan Gingas. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's such a great example um, of of giving, and it's why I, you know, I uh, for a long time looked at myself as a, a curator, or a, sorry, a creator on social media, and then I I intentionally became a curator as well, and so I love sharing other people's stuff, and oftentimes yeah. I will share other people's stuff knowing that you know at some point when my book launches i'm going to ask them to share my stuff and they're going to be more than happy to do that and i, I do think that you know you got to give before you take um the other thing i would I, I would suggest and obviously ryan you're great at this is when you're at an event you know don't be afraid to walk up to anybody i mean they're they're, oh, well, they're just people, yes. right and yeah. uh, one of the things I've loved about about having business calls on Zoom is that everybody at every level is now equal. We all have the same size box, right? And it's very different than you have to walk into the executive's office and they're yes. behind the big desk and it's intimidating or whatever. And I love that kind of everybody's on the same we're, we're all we're all at the same size on Zoom and yeah. and so hopefully that gives people the um, the confidence to speak up and to, you know, connect with somebody that maybe you, uh, you wouldn't have before. Um, I am uh, going to put this up again because now I know it is Shira. So now I've pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Thank you, Shira, for letting me know. Um, and networking and connections are some foundational pieces of business. Absolutely. And, and again, I think if anything, uh, you know, COVID has taught us how much we desire that human connection and, mm -hmm. uh, and we, especially when it's taken away from us. But I think that's going to be a, uh, something that's lasting is that people are going to appreciate their time with other human beings forever. That's now, right. now that we know that it can be taken away, uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll all appreciate it more. And I think we're all more human on the other side of this, you know, um, back to your point about the box and, um, you can hear everybody's dog barking and you see their environments and you know, it just, it just kind of humanized the whole thing. So I, yeah, love that side of it. I love that side of it. It's great. Um, awesome. Well, I, uh, Kim, thank you so much for taking the time before we go. Um, can you just tell how do people connect with you and yeah. maybe, what are you, what are you looking forward to next? Oh What's my goodness. What's going to happen in the next a couple months? I mean, you just launched. So obviously, yes. Yeah, but, yeah. So, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I've been so trying to launch um, and thinking about the next thing. So I, first of all, um, you can find me at um, Kim Alexis Newton on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm kind of the same all the way across Facebook. Um, and then KimAlexisNewton.com. So the good news is I locked in the brand. Yeah. <laughs> It's important. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it's so great. Um, but I'm looking forward to, so I, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk a lot about, you know, developing experiences, but I put a lot into my packaging um, because that was going to be my experience. And, you know, when you come from a big brand with a big budget and then you kind of go to your little brand with your, you got to really use those moments to make an impression. And I just, I, I had to bootstrap this thing. I launched it. I'm super proud of it, but I cannot wait until I can do what I really want to do and spread my wings um, because I want to make quilts for sympathy and for, you know, um, uh, for cancer. And I just have all of these designs that need to get out of me. And so I'm so looking forward to you know, now that I've kind of come out in the world. Um, and then I, I 
I am enjoying talking to people about their dreams. Like it's such a foreign concept to people to actually, you know, they do dream or show people dream, but they don't elevate them to the level that I want to elevate dreams to, right? Um, and we all have deep desires. And I just, I, I, I want more people living their dreams and uh, really thinking about that. So I'm, I love talking to people about that. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Well, and I love your word Actify too, which I, I noticed you are in the process of trademarking. That's awesome. So if I could summarize, I think you want to be the hallmark of quilting and <laughs> you want to help people activate their dreams, right? Actify yeah, their dreams. I love Girl. it. Yes, I'm trying to help them while I'm still trying to save myself. There's all that. <laughs> I love it. Well, Kim, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for taking That's time scary. to be on the show. And everybody connect with Kim. Uh, you will definitely not regret it. Uh, thank you again also to uh, our audience and to people who commented and uh, asked questions. I love that. I think it makes the show so much more engaging. So really appreciate that. I do want to uh, leave you with two things. First of all, next week's guest is Claire Musket. And Claire is the CEO of Women in CX. So Kim, you need to meet Claire if you don't know her already. She's also the author of How to Be Awesome at CX. And we're going to be at a special time next week because I actually have a conflict during my own live show next week. So we're going to be at 1030 a.m. Eastern instead of noon. Mark your calendars. Just kidding. You're not going to do that. That's fine. I will remind you on social media throughout the week, but excited to talk to Claire. And also a reminder, September 14th is getting close. It's the new book, The Experience Maker, How to Create Remarkable Experiences That Your Customers Can't Wait to Share. It is available for pre-order now on any site that you would order books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, uh, Walmart.com, wherever you want to go, you can pre-order I would super very much appreciate it and uh, really excited to get this out into the world. So thank you again, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm Dan Gingis, customer experience speaker and coach. We'll see you next week at a special time on the Experience Maker Show. Have a great rest of the day and a terrific weekend.